affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. There are times I read certain scriptures and I have to stop and think about how powerful they are and then I have to ask myself how good I am doing at applying those particular words or phrases. The Greeks had at least four different words for love. Three of those words are found in the immediate <coughs> context and text of, of our lesson this morning. From last Lord's Day morning's lesson, you'll see in verse 9 in Romans 12, let Love be without hypocrisy. The word that Paul used there is the Greek word agape. It's the same word that we have in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the same word you see in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold how good it is that we are how much love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. God's agape, God's love, gives. God's love bestows precious things on God's people. And that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have and not a hypocritical love, as Paul would tell us in verse 9. But the words that we have in verses 10 and following are, are a little different. As a matter of fact, we have the word phileo in verse 10, and that's brotherly love. We have a city in this country called Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It comes from the Bible, whether the people who named that city from the Bible, I do not know. But I'm thinking about these words and how words have meaning. When I tell Elisa I love you, that would be uh, a different kind of love. That's perhaps at the moment it's a, a feeling of love toward her, a, an amorous feeling. Or it could be the family kind of love, the Greek word storge, like I love you as my wife and as the mother of this family, and, and storge is the familiar word you would use in the family, say, like, I love Will, I love Amanda, we're glad she's here with us today. That's family love. You love your mother, you love your father, you love your grandfather, you love your grandchildren, you love your husband, wife, children. This brotherly love that we have here is is something that Paul emphasizes when he says to be devoted to one another in the New American Standard Version. In the New King James Version, it says, be kindly affectionate to one another in, with brotherly love, to show affection for another. 
And matter of fact, that's the word that Peter used when Jesus asked him in John chapter 20, you know, Peter, do you love me? John 22, do you, do you love me? I like you, Lord. Do you love me? I like you, Lord. I have affection for you, Lord. Do you have affection for me, Peter? Peter got upset with that third question. But that was the word that he used. I have affection for you, Lord. Because Peter knew that that higher level of love, that agape that Jesus was asking about, demanded a lot from him. But does not the action or the actions of showing affection to brothers and sisters in Christ require some humility and and purpose on my part. There are people in our world who are unkind to us. They say cruel and harsh things. They're very impatient with us. They use words that you don't want to repeat. They use words or phrases that will cut you to the core. And sometimes as Christians we have this tendency to forget that's not the way it's supposed to be in the church, to be kindly affectionate to one another. Now, I like to hug people if they like it. If, if they don't want to be hugged, then, then I don't force the issue. But you know, sometimes you just need that a little bit, a pat, of a pat on the back sometimes, showing a little affection a warm handshake, not, not some, don't give me a dead fish, as one of my brethren used to say, shake my hand, give me a warm, firm handshake, and show me that, that you're really glad to see me, and I'm really glad to see you, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be a brother and sister in Christ, because God has bestowed upon us the fact that we're children of God, and such we are, Paul would say, to be affectionate. To one another, how do we practice this? How do we tenderly love one another in the church? Well, I've been in the church long enough to know how we don't do it sometimes, haven't you? But I think about how we how we show it. I think about as a Christian husband in Ephesians chapter five, I believe it's verse twenty-eight. Paul says you're supposed to love your wife as your own body. A man never hated his own flesh, hated his own body. To show that love and affection toward her that, that she, she needs and support. And, of course, I'm commanded to do that. And I've been married long enough to know that's a very effective thing in marriage. To show that affection, to show kindness and sweetness to her and patient, be kind and loving. And Paul is contrasting between the church and marriage and Jesus was kind and loving and affectionate toward those that he spent time with on the earth. He loves the church so much that he gave himself for it. And as a Christian wife, a woman is to love her husband and be subject to him. Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 would tell us. In Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5, the Bible would tell a Christian mother, this woman is to love her children, to be sensible, to be pure, to be a worker at home. Titus 2, 4 and 5 for all of those, a Christian mother loving her children and loving her husband and being subject to him and showing the affection. Mamas, I want you to listen to me for a minute. Daddies, I want you to listen to me for a minute. Our children need our affection. They're not going to get it from anybody else. My dad was not a hugger. He, he just wasn't. But he would show his affection in words, in deeds, uh, he just, you know, I had to teach him to hug me because I learned to do that. You know, there's some people in the church, if you meet them, you're going to get hugged whether you like it or not. But so, you know, so I, I noticed that, well, at least his family, they, they, her daddy's a hugger. If you've met Glenn Wooders and you get to know him, he's going to hug you now. 
If you don't watch, he'll kiss you on the cheek. But my daddy wasn't a hugger. But we have these affectionate ways of showing that we care for one another and fathers and sons and fathers and daughters and mothers and sons and daughters. And as a Christian son, I have an obligation to show love and kindness and affection toward my mother. And it's not because she's 84. It's because she's my mother. I need to show that to her to express kindness. And as people get a little older, you do need to practice that patience factor, do you not? And as we get a little older, you all need to be a little patient with us sometimes. Um, I have to tell you something humorous. Uh, my brother and I were talking to my mom about the possibility of going and living in a senior apartment. And um, we went and looked at one, and we got in the car to leave. She says, well, there's just a bunch of old people in there. And, of course, what are you going to say? You're not going to say anything. Say, yeah, Mama, there he is. You know, just leave it there. But to be affectionate and kind and patient... And then, but then the next day she'll say, you know, I'm 84 years old. So what about in the church, though? See, I can show this affection, and I'm getting a little more, I guess you'd say, affectionate toward my mother because I know I won't have a whole lot more opportunity to do that, right? But, we, but Paul says, look, you show affection for your mother, and you show affection for your children, and your grandpa and your grandchildren, you bring that into the church because we are family. We have to learn how people appreciate affection and how they don't, and I know you have to be careful about that. But somehow it comes through you after you separate that person. I know that brother or sister, they care about me. I could just tell by the way they responded. And, and you know, in the, in the world we live in, in the church, we need that. And God knew we needed it. He knew we needed mutual support and concern and love and tenderness because of the old, cold, cruel, harsh world. And, and we need that in the kingdom. How do we exercise, exercise it? Well, first of all, it's an attitude. You know, love is something you do, but it comes from what you think, the way you process things. And before I can act, I have to think about it. Matter of fact, Paul would tell the church to be. I, I've always wondered, why God, why God, why do you have to tell us to do these things? And, and he could come back with heaven's retort, say, well, because you're not going to do it naturally, that's why. I have to tell you this, and I think, you know, you got God, you're right, and I'm sorry I asked that question. I knew the answer. I just didn't think about it. But to be this way, is it a command to do this? It is a command to do this. And so I'm just not, I'm just not very good at that. Well, it's something to practice, and somehow show. And, and you know, some people they want a little more attention than others. And I'm, I'm going to say this because I'm in a position of a preacher. Uh, I understand that, and you know what? It's okay. It's all right if somebody wants a little more attention than others. Some people don't want to be bothered, and I think that's okay too, to a point. To a point. But <clears throat> if it helps somebody live their Christian life a little easier, to give a little more attention, a little more time, then let's do it. Let's be that way. Because evidently they're saying, I need that. Now I know then a kind word is needed. A hug if people are comfortable with that. And showing concerns for my fellow saints the same way that I do my own family. To the, to, I, we know it's limited, but still, how do we interact with one another? Be this way. And... Hold one another in honor, in preference. The church is God's blood-bought people. I think he kind of prefers us, don't you? I think God kind of honors us because we, he calls us his children. Everybody's not God's child. 
Well, they may claim to be, but those who are really God's children, God looks down and he says, that's my boy right there. That's my son. That's my daughter. I, I, and, and I'm bestowing upon them my love. I'm giving them a name. My child. And you know, there are a lot of people who don't know who their parents are. Some people have children and they don't know they've got them. Isn't that a sad commentary on some people's lives? Well, God has children and he knows he has them. Then you think about our attitude towards zeal and doing the Lord's work. Paul says, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Paul shifts to a different idea, but all of this fits together because he's talking about God's people, and the whole thing begins by being a living sacrifice in the first part of the chapter. You'll remember as we started chapter 12, I made the point, chapters 1 through 11 in Romans are doctrinal, chapters 12 and following are practical. How you put into practice the things that Christians ought to be. We ought to be kindly affectionate to one another, preferring one another, and, and your King James Bible, and I guess the New King James Bible, Bible says, don't be slothful. In 19, I mean, 2009, I think it was, um, Ellie and Lisa and Will and I and Clay went to Panama in an area called Bocas del Toro. And Bocas is a jungle. It's not as much as it used to be. They've cut a road through there. The first time I went, you had to fly in uh, by plane and hope the door didn't fall off of it, literally. And then you'd get in a boat and go up a river to some of these villages, and you'd find Christians up in there. And They've cut a road now, but we were out there one day, and somebody said, hey, there's a sloth up there in this tree. Well, I'd never seen one, and of course it was, and they, I can't move as slow as a sloth. I just can't move that slowly. I guess if I went to sleep, but what are you talking about, Paul? Don't be slothful. Don't be slow. As a matter of fact, you don't lag behind in diligence. Thinking about God's work. Thinking about God's kingdom. Jesus purchased the church and paid his, the blood price so that the whole world could be saved from sin. And he sent, he prepared 12 men and one fell away and he told those 11, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because the message that they carried was and is a saving message. Therefore, if it saves people, you know, you, you may have your life insurance paid up a lot of people do. And you may have your burial plan in place. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, but people get those things, and you're looking forward to the time when you're going to pay off this debt, and you'll be debt-free from that. And we, we have these goals, and we're zealous to get that done. Because I don't want to die... And, and leave my wife in debt so I have life insurance. I, I was diligent to get that. I'm not going to leave her in the lurch. And chances are I'll die first. That's just usually the way it goes. And, and really I ought to get more on her in case she dies first. Then I'd have it pretty good. But, <laughs> but thinking about being zealous, you know, you've got to throw a little humor in here sometimes. Are we as zealous for God's work as we are about taking care of these things? Make sure you've got that homeowner's paid up because if you leave that skillet on and the fire starts and you're not home, you're going to lose everything you've got. We're zealous to keep that in place. And you won't drive in Georgia without auto insurance very long till they'll take your license and your plate and whatever else they might decide to do but I think about God's work to be zealous for it, not lagging behind. And so I think about Apollos. You read about Apollos in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26. 
And the Apostle Paul comes upon, has gotten to know Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla, who were Christians. They heard Apollos preaching. Well, who was Apollos? Well, verse 24 says he was an Alexandrian by birth. He was an eloquent man. He came to Ephesus. And he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Watch this. And being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. Being acquainted only with the baptism of John, he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Well, it sounds sounds like a, a, a zealous man, and he was. But there was an error with him. So Priscilla and Aquila, they heard him. And they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. But here was a man who was zealous in what he knew. Zealous in what he understood. He was zealous in presenting the message of God that he understood. And I'm thinking, here's a man in error, but he's zealous in his error. Are we as zealous with the truth as he was with error? Because what he was preaching couldn't save anybody. It was John's baptism was null and void at this point, but he was zealous. Paul would talk about the Jews in Romans chapter 10. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Zeal is good. But to, to quote one brother who got his grammar wrong, it's gooder when it's connected with truth. Do we understand that what the Bible teaches on salvation, on the church, on on the important matters of Christianity? Are we as zealous to share this as we are? To say, hey, I can get you a better deal on car insurance than you have right now. We're, we're quick to share that. And, and, and I, I can tell you, you know, if you're going to buy a new car, I can tell you where you can get a really, really good interest rate. Or I can tell you where gas is just a little bit cheaper. And we're good at that, and that's okay. It has its place. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how to get to heaven, and I can. And I can tell you exactly how to do it. And I need to be zealous in that because people are going to hell every day. May I repeat that? People are going to hell every day. I thank God for Aquila and Priscilla taking this man saying, Apollos, we need to show you something here. The, the baptism of John is no longer effective. I doubt for one second that Apollos lost his zeal. I, when he, he Later you'll find he, Paul had his name. He became a gospel preacher of truth. And I'm going to plug it in here that Aquila and Priscilla had zeal for telling him. We need to be zealous for God's work because it's the only work in the world, it really, really, it's like the word zeal means a burning desire. A burning desire. And we can't be lazy. We can't be slothful. Several years ago, when the Hee Haw show was on TV, we used to watch it, and maybe some of you did. And if you watched it when it was fresh, you're telling your age a little bit. But these two old fellows were lying there and leaned up against a couple of bales of hay, and one of them said, hey. The other one said, what? There sure is a pretty girl over here. And the other one said, I wish my head was turned that way. <laughs> now, that's lazy. That's lazy. And you apply that, and you think, you know, was Jesus lazy? Was he zealous? What about John the Baptist? When he was preaching the baptism for the right time, was he zealous? Oh, he was. Jesus would say, talk about him, said, what would you go out to see? Some reed shaken by the wind? Not John. No. What about later when he preached to Herod about his unscriptural marriage? He was zealous for truth. What about Paul? What about Peter? Finally opened his mouth and said the right things. Became an elder in the Lord's church in Jerusalem because they were zealous. So we need to be zealous in God's work. Finally, I want to talk for a minute or two about hope. 
Sometimes somebody says, well, let's see, January be rolling around. I hope I can get my vacation at such and such a time. Matter of fact, I've been with this company long enough. I think I've got two weeks coming next year. And I hope I get to go here, and I hope that... And we know that that means that that's a possibility, but it's not confirmed. You may or may not get to go where you want to go. You may not get to the, the two weeks. And then again, you might, but you might not get the two weeks when you want them. And, you know, I hope one day to be able to, to do some things in life. And we know that's, that's not sure. Listen, Bible hope is not that way. Please hear what I'm saying. Bible hope is not a maybe. It's not, well, it could be. No, it's, Bible hope is real. When you talk about hope in the Bible, it has an entirely different meaning. Listen to Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, going through verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Watch this. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. You don't exult in something that's a maybe. We exult in hope of the glory of God. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. The stronger one is, the more they combat the world, the more they stand with and fight for the Lord. They strengthen their hope. You have that firm hope in your heart. Hope was there, but it's in your heart. And hope does not disappoint. That's what the Bible says. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Keep going, Paul. But much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That is hope. That's what Bible hope is. Keep going, Paul. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Brothers and sisters and friends, that's Bible hope. That's a promise. We shall be saved by his life, because Jesus died and was buried and resurrected. He's alive. Romans 8, 23 through 25. Not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Watch. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. What is it, Paul, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eager, eagerly wait for it. What, what, what are you talking about, Paul? Well, we're talking about salvation in heaven. There are two aspects to our salvation. There's that aspect when you become a child of God, you're forgiven of your sins. You're in a saved condition. If you be faithful unto death... You'll be saved when, at the end of time. But you've not realized the ultimate salvation yet because you haven't died. And the judgment hasn't happened. The scripture is very clear about this. Watch this, Colossians 3, 1 through 6. But we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. I'm sorry, Colossians 1, 3 through 6. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. You see, the ultimate hope is in heaven. But it's not a maybe. It's not an if. Now, it's, now getting to heaven is conditional. We understand that. But the promise is real. The hope is real. It's not a maybe. And he says, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you. Now, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul speaks of those who have no hope. And he's talking about the second coming of Christ and how ultimately one would ever, ever be with the Lord. Bible hope is a promise that will come to the faithful child of God. It's not a maybe. And so, you know, Saturday is football this time of year. And if you have to wonder if I'm a UT Vols fan, I'll just let you know I am. And, and they served Gator in Knoxville yesterday. Now, I hope your team won. I really do. But, you know, that's just a game. It's over. It's in the record books. It's a victory, but it's over. And in that game will never be played again. And, and so we can think about those things. And we think about victories. And, and I used to, when I was in high school, I'd root for our football team. And, and when Ellie uh, played in the band, we'd go root for them. And they go these, did a contest or two in Florida. Yeah, we, but, that's, but once it's done, it's done. We're talking about eternal hope. We're talking about an eternal victory that's never going to be taken away from us. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a what? Living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because Jesus is alive you and I have a living hope to obtain an inheritance. He's talking about heaven. What kind of inheritance is it, Peter? It's an imperishable inheritance. You know, whoever wins these ultimate championships for, for, the, uh, for the college football, they'll get a trophy. And, you know, one of these days that trophy is going to age. It'll lose its shine. Somebody might steal it, you know. It could fall off the shelf and get broken. It could burn up in a fire. Things can happen. We're getting an inheritance that's imperishable and it's undefiled and will not fade away. Where is it, Peter, reserved in heaven for you, brethren? That's, that's Bible hope. I want you to remember these verses and I'll give them to you after it's over if you want them. Bible hope is not a maybe. Please remember that. Now we know we have to be faithful, but it's not a maybe. It's not a, well, you know, I hope I get to go to heaven. I'm glad I'm not as miserable as some of my brethren who say that. If, unless they're using hope in a biblical sense, and I say amen. What do you say, Peter? Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There is a final and ultimate salvation. And it, now people talk about once saved, always saved. We know we can fall away. But if you go to heaven, you don't have to be concerned about that. You'll be there forever. Now, brethren, that's Bible hope. This morning, we have looked at loving our brethren affectionately. I believe that plays a vital role in helping us get to heaven together. We've also looking, looked at being zealous for God's work. I know that plays a vital role in helping folks get to heaven, including some of us. And then we've looked at Bible hope, and it's real. Do you have that hope this morning? Do you have that hope in your heart that you know you're faithful? I know... <coughs> that death is a scary thing. I know that. Everybody's a little bit afraid of it, aren't they? Sure you are. You're human. I was listening to a sermon recently by Brother Tom Holland, and, and somebody had called Brother Tom, and this person was in the hospital, and, and, and uh, Somebody called and said, we want you to come see, see this person. And my understanding, this person is not a Christian. And he said, went to see this person and, and had never met her before. And she says, 
I'm not afraid to die. But I'm afraid to meet God. I thought that lady didn't have any hope, did she? I'm afraid to meet God. Brethren, the Bible gives a Christian who's faithful hope. Yeah, I'm a little afraid of death, but I better not be afraid to meet God. If I'm faithful, I won't be. How about you this morning? Are you subject to the Master's invitation in any way? He's a patient, loving God. He waits, but sometimes his patience wears out too. And sometimes we don't get second chances to make things right. You may need to make something right this morning. You may need to become a Christian, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Have all your sins washed away. Become a Christian. Be added to the Lord's church. We'll talk about that a little more tonight. But add to the church that Jesus died for. You live faithfully, you'll have hope. If you feel like you have no hope this morning, you need any prayers, please come as we stand, as we sing.